Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today's guest, Dr. Colin Zhu, had a family emergency, so he is going to be coming on again sometime this week. So we have a wonderful guest that's going to step in, because I don't want to break my streak of going live every day since March 2020, 20. March 20th, 2020, almost four years, but you're going to love him. It's funny because he's already scheduled next week and he said he'd still come back for his regular slot, which is the first Tuesday of the month for Straight Talk with Dr. Doug Lyle. But we have such a backlog of questions. Hey, we could have them every day as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much, Dr. Lyle, for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, AJ. Oh, are you kidding? So guys, if you have not read The Pleasure Trap, it is a fantastic book. And it's also on audio with a fantastic voice narrator. No, just kidding. That's me. <laughs> but but it it was a hard book to narrate, Dr. Lyle, because I had to keep calling um, you guys, you know, from the studio. How do you pronounce this word? How do you pronounce that word? So anyway, so the first question actually is legitimately on the pleasure trap. And this is from Susanna. She said, could Dr. Lyle please explain what Y-O-W-L, Yowl circuits are? I really didn't fully understand it after reading The Pleasure Trap. Yes, uh, that's a, I, uh, I made that up. In other words, so what these are is they are, uh, uh, what, what you have inside, inside of you in, in many, uh, with respect to many motivational processes, is that you have uh, checks and balances. Just kind of like our government has the, you know, the legislative and judicial and executive branches that they're designed by nature to check and balance each other. The same thing is true with your body has all kinds of things like this. It has checks and balances. And so when you get overweight, what happens is, is that your fat stores start to secrete leptin. And that's a hormone that then is, is, uh, has an influence on your behavior that you know it's completely unconscious you don't know that this is happening but it causes you to want to eat less so essentially what i'm saying is if, if what if you're overweight you already have a system that says you're overweight eat less yowl and uh and so i said i didn't know how to spell yowl when i did that and then jennifer morano read that thing and said well yowl is actually y-o-w-l <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, we're going to we're going to make up our own word. Uh, Y-O-W-E-L, you're overweight, eat less. And so that's my way of explaining that this is why if, in order to lose weight, you don't need to eat less than you want. All you have to do is you eat the right calorie density of foods. And what happens is, is that that circuit is already on. In other words, it's it's already telling you you're overweight, eat less. And so the, the amount of food, let's suppose you're 50 pounds overweight. And let's suppose that it requires 2,000 calories a day for you to actually take care of your basic metabolic functions, which will be true whether you're 50 pounds overweight or you're at an ideal weight. In other words, it's the same thing that the fat just is sort of sitting there on top of of the rest of your body. It's not causing the uh, uh, metabolic expense to speak of. And so as a result, that same 2000 calories, whether you're 200 pounds or 150 pounds, it's the same 2000 calories. And so that's what it would take for you to maintain your weight. If you're 150 calories or 150 pounds, let's say that that's an ideal weight for you. The, uh, but it, uh, but at two uh, but at two hundred pounds, if you start eating two thousand calories a day, you'll start to lose weight. Now, not only will you start to lose weight, but it's also true that you don't even want two thousand calories of whole natural food because the excess fat stores on your body are going to shave off probably ten percent of your hunger drive. So you'll only eat eighteen hundred calories a day. So actually you will lose, 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 lose as you are systematically under eating all the way down to your ideal weight. Once you get there, then interestingly enough, now you'll start eating 2000 calories. You won't, you will not have noticed this process because it's not like a switch that goes on or off. As you get down close to your, uh, an excellent weight for you, 
those circuits quiet down. Okay. Uh, now I read uh, someplace deep in the scientific literature somewhere, somebody said that every anybody that is 25 pounds overweight, those YAL circuits are turned on 24 seven. In other words, you, your hunger drive is being muted. And at which point some people say, well, gee, if that's true, why am I overweight? And the answer is because you are clearly eating food that is in excess of the natural calorie density for our species. I'm gonna let this cat out. Come on, come on, you're bugging me. Let's go. Who let the cat oh. out? Meow, meow, meow. Who let the cat out? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so that's um that that's what my understanding is. I, I haven't I haven't researched that literature in 10, 15 years, but but it made complete sense to me. And since that time, um, it, it turns out that there's been an awful lot of research in the pharmaceutical industry trying to figure out how to essentially stoke leptin production. Uh, and just as all these things that people do to try to Mickey Mouse their way around this problem, they have typically found that when they do that, they'll have a short-term effect, i.e. if you increase the amount of leptin, you will cause that hunger muting mechanism to get turned on more intensively and it will reduce people's uh, desire to eat. However, uh, it's been found that the system will compensate its way around it. Just, you know, this is how it works. So you're, you're, it, when you try to Mickey Mouse your way around, around a innate system, the innate system finds a way to worm its way around your influence. And so, yeah, it, you know, now they've got some other drugs that are more powerful and they have some, you know, believe me, there's going to be all kinds of nasty lawsuits and, and uh, uh, damage done by, by any of these weight, weight loss drugs because you are attempting to stop a system from working as it's designed. And so, you know, they, they have not solved that problem. The only way to solve that problem is to eat right. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. So uh, this question was it from uh, Renee? Just it just tickled me and Charles because we were both liberal arts majors. And it's Dr. Lyle. Why do liberal arts majors make so little money? My parents never gave me any guidance in choosing a career path, and I wound up in a profession with low pay. And I don't want that to happen to my children. But what if they're interested in art or music or literature and want to pick a major with very low pay, just like me? Well, I would say several things about that. Uh, my father uh, said to me that, you know, you're not, I'm not sending you to school unless you're going to get a license to steal. So he, uh, he had been a business major, then a math major, and he had watched his family, his broader family, all go into the law. And he found that they all got wealthy, and he didn't. And so when it came to raising his kids, um, he would tell my sister and I when we were you know, teenagers, he said, yeah, you, you, of course you're going to go to college, but when you go, you're going to get a license to steal. <clears throat> In other words, you're going to learn some skill or become part of some professional class where you were protected in some important fashion or you had some something really important that you could do that people wanted to pay money for i.e a license to steal the uh, now why is that a wise thing to do and why do we not have people major in liberal arts well if you're independently wealthy go ahead and major in liberal arts i don't care um if you if you have time and money to do that, so if you're a young Steven Spielberg, and you're like I'm gonna I'm gonna be in the film industry. Now it turns out that let's suppose that guy had just as much ambition, but two two notches less talent. So it turns out he can't make a living in the film industry after all. But he burned to do it. He wanted to do that more than anything. So let's suppose he had you know, came from a solid middle-class family that was supportive of that. And they said, you go right ahead, Stephen. You spend your 20s spinning your wheels in Hollywood, doing everything you can do. And then if you fail, that's okay. You've got your undergrad degree. You can go back to law school. 
and then you then you can be a lawyer just like your your uncle Stu. Okay, that's fine. That's no no problem if we're ten years late, you know, and that's what happens. the The problem is is to think that uh, liberal arts sort of a process is some kind of uh, legitimate pathway towards a career. Of course it's not. Uh, these are the arts, for example. Um, they're, they're, I, I have adopted a phrase. There, there, are, there are two problems, um, two big problems in life. The two big problems in life are survival problems and reproduction problems. And it's going to turn out that all kinds of people have all kinds of survival problems. So they need their teeth fixed. They've got a root canal. They, you know, they, they need their skin. They're worried about a spot on their skin. So they need to go see a dermatologist. They, they need their feet, you know, looked at. And so they need an orthotic spade. They have, you know, a problem with the radiator on their car. There is no end to the basic survival problems. The, um, however, <clears throat> people also have reproduction problems. So reproduction problems, um, the, so there's ways that they're going to go about reproduction process. So they want to be beautiful. They want to have great hair. They want to have great clothes. There's other ways to serve them and their needs. You are trying to bring something to the marketplace in order to trade, in order to make a living. So you might be snaking out people's sewers, or you might be doing their accounting, but you are doing something to help people on the other side of the equation. Now, the arts are kind of interesting. I mean, really, at the, at the top end of here would be performing arts. So now let me see what it is that I'm doing for people if I'm an actor or an actress or a model or something like this, it's like, or a professional athlete. What I'm actually doing is I'm solving my own reproduction problem um, because I'm attempting to make what we're going to call a sexual display. So sexual displays are um, uh, ways that we demonstrate extraordinary genetic characteristics to the marketplace so that they can ooh and ah and be impressed, okay? That's not solving a survival or reproductive problem for those people, that's us showing off, okay? So in the Stone Age Village, nobody made a living making sexual displays. What they did was they went and dug potatoes out of the ground or they hunted uh, or they gathered medicines to help people with their problems. In other words, they, you know, they, they sewed grass together to make moccasins. They made fish hooks. What they did not do is they did not do art, not for a living. Art was what they did in order to display their sexual characteristics. If they were a fantastic artist, they might have painted on rocks or they might have carved, uh, in other words, to display. And what those are is those are displays uh, uh, what what those are, what sexual displays are, is they are displays of what we call fitness indicators. So there's going to be people that are going to say, "Oh no, I, I don't, I don't play professional football for sexual display. I just love it. Okay, I I don't play the piano for sexual display. I just love it. Yeah, right. You're designed as a human animal to make sexual displays. Of course you love it. That's that you're, you're designed to do that. You're designed to love the process of making sexual displays, even if you don't understand that the purpose of those sexual displays is to attract mates. You don't have to be, you could say, no, I've already got my mate, I'm completely fine. You're still doing it. So it's gonna turn out that only in the modern environment can you have a completely bizarre situation that is an opportunity for some people. And that is that literally they can make a living while they do sexual displays. That is, this doesn't happen anywhere in nature. There's no aardvark that can pull that off. But if you're Dean Martin, you can. Okay. So Dean Martin got to do sexual displays while he made a fortune full of money. How good is that? 
Same thing with LeBron James. My God, he loves to play basketball. He's not just doing it for the money. He loves to do it. Okay. Why? Well, watch him when he has a big, uh, a big basket and a big game. He'll literally beat his chest like Tarzan. Can't help himself. Okay. Guys will do this. Okay. This, these are universal signs of dominance and victory is to hold your hands over your head. Okay. Or, or expand your chest out and rah, like that. You'll see guys do that too. Sexual displays. They love making sexual displays. If they can make $10 million a year doing it, why not? Why wouldn't we do that? Okay. So the point is, is that sexual displays make terrible careers. <laughs> the reason is, is that only one tenth of one tenth and one tenth of one percent actually can make a living doing it. So I think the 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 mean amount of income for people in the Screen Actors Guild is like four hundred seventy seven dollars a year or something. In other words, nobody makes any money in there. Fifty people make a fortune. Same thing with basketball. I play basketball. I, I played as much basketball in my life as LeBron James played in his. Okay, he's a lot younger than I am, but I'm, I'm exaggerating, but not that much. Okay, so it's like you can only play so much basketball. You can play two or three hours a day. That's about all you can do. Well, hell, I played a hell of a lot of basketball. Nobody's paid me a cent. <laughs> okay, why do I do it? Sexual display. Well, there's no girls watching. Yes, but in theory, someday there might be if I keep working at it. Okay, there was there was one. Uh, Lady, I would have liked to have her watch, but she says, you know, Doug, actually, I I would like to, but I, I really can't watch because I can't stand the squeaky of the sneakers on the floor. So sorry, I, I can't watch it. <laughs> oh, such is life. OK, so that's what a liberal arts degree is. Liberal arts degree is dangling something in front of us that we can make a living out of sexual displays. OK. That is a mistake. That's a false assumption. You're not going to be able to make a living out of sexual displays. If you if you do, it's going to be rare. And if you've got rare talent and rare drive to do it, good, then go ahead and do it. And my attitude is be Steven Spielberg or try. And then by the time you're about 30, you're going to be figuring out that apparently I'm not Steven Spielberg and I'm not actually even a third assistant director. And, you know, I can't make a living doing this. Maybe it's time to go back to law school and join, you know, Uncle Louie's firm. <laughs> so that's the answer. Yes, you, you got talked into uh, the it's a very kind and dreamy thing for college counselors and people to say, yes, you should follow your dreams. If you're really interested in French Impressionist art, then absolutely, if you love that, you know, you should major in it. You will love it. It's like, yeah, how are you going to pay the $80,000 worth of student loans that came with getting that degree? You know, nobody is hiring French Impressionist art experts out of school and paying them $100,000. Never happened. So get, you know, get serious. You're, you should be thinking about how you are going to be good at solving somebody else's problem, not displaying your sexual characteristics, okay? Cut out gallbladders, okay? Cut hair, make orthotics, snake out people's drains, fix their refrigerators, okay? Do something useful for other people. If your college degree doesn't directly help you do something useful for other people, it's a waste of time and money. There you go. So isn't social media, especially like Instagram and TikTok, just a big sexual display? Yeah, that's exactly what you're saying. You're going to find the vast majority, I don't know, Kylie or Kyrie Jenner or whoever the hell she is. I don't even know. I, I wouldn't recognize her if my life depended on it. But I understand that 24-year-old girl was is a billionaire. It's like, holy smokes. You know, people in, this is again, you know, there's going to be another 100 million girls that think that they're going to be able to pull something like that off. They're not. Okay. 
sexual displays make lousy careers. That is like saying, wow, I want to be just like Joe Montana. Well, there is one of those. <laughs> Charles Barkley, like in his in his uh, bumbling, but no nonsense way that he goes about saying things once. He said, he said, I can't stand it when I hear mothers tell their children they can be anything they want to be. He goes, they can't. There's only one Michael Jordan and one Charles Barkley. There's only one of those. Notice how he wedded himself with the one. <laughs> but the truth is, Charles was probably the second best basketball player in the world at that time, right behind, right behind uh, Michael Jordan in about 1992. And there's a reason why Charles Barkley, you know what I mean, made $100 million in his career, because he was one in a billion. So... That, that like I said, if you if you love French impressionist art and you want to get a degree in it, go ahead. But get good grades because you're aiming at grad school somewhere. <laughs> I wish I had known you in high school. I mean, we could have known each other both in LA, roughly the same age, because I would have probably done a different major, you know? Yeah. yeah. That my my friend Larry says the same thing. He's like, man. Where where was Rob Lyle when I needed him? <laughs> yeah, my, my major was speech communications, and I chose it because I didn't like math and I didn't like science, and you know I could I I, I knew I could talk. Yes, and it, it's like it, it's not unreasonable, and it's not unreasonable what people are doing, but they're not they're not thinking it through. They 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 don't they don't have a, a a ruthless mathematician like my dad sitting on the other end of this who also bashed his own head in as he watched his relatives that went into blog do, do better than he did. And, and hell, they weren't as smart as he was. Yeah, so it, It's amazing go. to me how many careers that don't even involve going to college you can make so much money at. Sure. You're just talking like, I remember many years ago, I was an apartment manager and I, you know, I got friendly with the vendors. And I mean, this guy that was an elevator repairman, I mean, he was making an extraordinary amount of money like fixing elevators. And I'm like, shoot, like I'm an apartment manager. I want to be an elevator repairman, you know? My dad, my dad had great respect for those people. And he, he came home one day and he told me, let me tell you, kid, about this guy uh, uh, that he had met who was, all he did was he, uh, he changed leaky shower pans. So underneath your shower, there's a, there's a pan in there, like a metal pan that they, if they leak, then et cetera. This guy back in 1980 was doing, he could do, uh, he could change one out in like an hour. He was so good. This guy, and he would make $100 doing one, which was about $500 in today's dollars. And he could do eight of them in a day. And my, you know, so he could make the equivalent of $4,000 in today's dollars a day. And my dad was just absolutely dazzled by it. He says he didn't he didn't always have eight. The guy would sometimes have two or three or one. But the point is, is that this little entrepreneur with a useful skill was making, you know, as much money as a medical doctor. And my dad just thought that that was just fantastic and always did. So, yeah. It, anyway. Well, I mean, it, it's cr it's crazy that a, a successful YouTuber can make more than a medical doctor. Of course. Yeah. And they uh, but anyway, the bottom line is, is I still think. Um, I still think a career education towards career is a very potentially good thing that you got to know what you're aiming at. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, this is a timely question with the holidays upon us, and it is from Ralph. Uh, Dr. Doug, my wife and I are plant-based, but she does a fair amount of rich and junk food that I want to avoid. I'm trying to go more McDougal AJ style, but from time to time, I find myself eating that crap because it's there and it tastes good. Also on holidays, like on holidays we're in, she makes a huge feast with pies and rich vegan food with fake cheese or whatever. And then we have the leftovers for a week. Any suggestions? Willpower isn't a great long-term solution. Thanks. Yeah, I would say the following is true. So she's sort of displaying, okay? So i.e. sexual displays for females wind up being cooking in the kitchen. 
uh, it's a, an artistry to it. So we wouldn't necessarily want to shut that down because there's great joy in that. However, if we're smart, we get we we try to gauge it so that we don't have a week's worth of leftovers. And if we do, then you know, depending upon who you are and what your finances are, uh, the, a, a good attitude is to throw it all out. Okay, so you might eat leftovers for a day and then get rid of all of them, gone off with their head. Anything that's not that's not in line with your goals. So we think about you know people people will. Um, think nothing of, of essentially, you know, paying for some program where they go and they spend, you know, a couple, $3,000 to get educated in plant-based living, et cetera, which is not, I'm not saying it's a waste of money, but I'm saying they, they will, they will do that, but they won't throw out a hundred dollars with the crap that's in their house. It's like, yeah. man, the most valuable thing you can do is go to the garbage and throw all that stuff out. Okay. Now it's like, oh God, I can't waste it. It's like, oh, I know you can't waste it, but you can, you can eat that and then go sign up for some seminar that's going to cost you a bunch of money. It's supposed to fix that problem. No, the problem is a simple issue in your environment. So if you're, if you've got an indulgent process that's going to go on the holidays, for goodness sakes, the smartest move that you can make on the chessboard is, you know, a day later, by the by the evening of day two of the day after, you know, have your meal, wake up the next day and throw all the stuff out. Then you're done. Okay, So that's how I would do it. In other words, you're, you're not going to be a saint and stay out of there, but you can sure as hell say, hey, party's over, you know. We've done our display. We've fed everybody up to their gills. We've eaten up to the gills. Time to kill it right there. And that's how I would do it. Yeah. Do you, but can you, if the person wants to do a private session based on the personality of the individuals to find the best way to permanently negotiate a clean environment? Because I find the biggest problem in this space is this is this problem of, of a mismatch of what the, the goals are and the environment not being clean. All kinds, of, uh, of course. People can always call me, and it turns out uh, uh, I was having such trouble with my uh, scheduling system that I don't know what happened to that scheduling system. So I got a brand new one, and it turns out it's a lot easier for people. So if people have been fighting my scheduling system for the last five years, which you know, believe me, I understand that they have, but it was I I got that scheduling system because I I thought it was the you know, the best one for all kinds of reasons that it turned out to be very cumbersome. So I got a better scheduling system. So just so if, if, if you got headaches from trying to schedule with me two years ago, know now that it's a lot easier. So I absolutely, I'm happy to talk to people about all these kinds of issues with their family, friends, and battles within themselves. You know, these are, these are tough things, Not, nothing tougher than the pleasure draft. You, you often said that people vastly underestimate the power of it. And there's a live viewer. We, we, we don't have to answer this question, but for example, it, she, it, the person's asking, what are typical childhood experiences, which may lead somebody having a food addiction? I don't think you need any childhood experiences. You just, if you're in an environment with it, you're going to eat it like you say. And when it comes to drugs and alcohol, I think spouses or family members understand. But when it comes to food, I don't think they understand how hard it is for an individual to coexist with certain foods. Oh, yeah. Well, this person's comment just tripped off a little lever in my head. So now I'm going to go off on this for a few minutes. Uh, oh, I was, I was afraid of. We usually don't take live comments, but okay. I was, okay. All right. So the issue is, is that if we're going to try to understand addiction, um, of any kind, whether we're talking about heroin or coffee or cigarettes, alcohol or rich food, okay, or gambling or pornography, etc. All what we're talking about is that inside, okay, understand that what's what's causing a decision to be made is a cost-benefit analysis. So the cost-benefit analysis is unconscious and wordless. In other words, it's just a these are these are systems inside. Like you don't decide, you don't taste an apple and say, oh, well, I know what that is. That's a 300 calorie a pound carbohydrate. You don't have words like that. 
you just have a, a, a nervous system that senses the biological value and calibrates it. And when I say calibrated, it's like, well, as you're tasting, you can say, ah, it's a little mealy and it's not that sweet and I'm not that hungry. But if you hadn't eaten in five days and you were on a shipwreck and you were eating that apple, you wouldn't be complaining about the fact that it was kind of not that sweet and it was kind of mealy. You'd be super happy to get it. So you calibrate the value of all stimulation relative to your survival and reproductive problems at any given moment in your existence. So if I'm sitting there eating a really good apple, but suddenly a bumblebee lands on my, my wrist, now I'm not at all, I stop chewing the apple immediately and I freeze, okay? So I'm not thinking about eating the apple now, I'm now focused on something else that's much more problematic. So your mind is always running cost-benefit analysis. <clears throat> and when there's a benefit, the only thing that causes an addictive process is there's a benefit. So there's a benefit to rich food. There's a benefit to opiates. Okay, what's the benefit to opiate? It's the release of endorphins. What's the release of endorphins? It's a relief chemical of the relaxed euphoria that takes place in digestion of food or post-act orgasm sexually. So those are, those are things, in other words, that system is designed by nature to signal very important biological success. So it's going to turn out that any stimulus or any, 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 uh, any stimulus event is going to be uh, that if it's positive, it's because there's a value embedded in it. Okay. So if you're gambling, this is uh, what's embedded in the gambling process is the notion that you could get a bunch of resources for not very much effort. So you're like, well, and that's a natural thing, by the way. So human beings, gambling is a derivative of, <clears throat> of actually trade processes. Just like if you were to got a sale, a little vendor in the Stone Age says, gosh, you know what? I, I need to run out of town, you know, to go visit my sister over there. And so I'm just giving up all my coconuts really cheap. So now they're, you know, one, one, uh, you know, one seashell for, for seven coconuts. It's like, wow, we're really excited. It's a super great cost benefit analysis. That's exactly what's happening in gambling. Gambling is the notion that I can get an awful lot for a little. That's all it is. Okay. So it's a stylized version of that thing, but that's what it is. Now, so all, so what we're talking about is concentrated or intensified stimuli. Intensified stimuli. In other words, the value has been intensified or so oftentimes through a distillation process literally chemically distilled so for example coca leaves would could be chewed in south america for the last fifty thousand years and people would notice a very very slight uptick in their energy but it wasn't until they synthesized cocaine out of those leaves that you have an addictive drug okay so the same thing is true of alcohol the same thing is true of cigarettes people would be chewing tobacco but they, you know, the Indians, you know, here were chewing tobacco, Native Americans for thousands of years. But until you figured out how to turn, you know, turn it into smoke, now you've got something more intensified. So, and then you put nicotine in it and all that sort of jazz. So here's the deal. So what addiction is, addiction is the underlying natural cost benefit system that resides inside the organism that would do its job perfectly. It would, there is no addiction in nature. There's no aardvark is addicted to anything. No walrus is addicted to anything. No giraffe is addicted to anything. Why? Because if there was anything in the environment that caused them to do self-destructive, self-indulgent behavior that would impel them to do something that they really loved to do because it was just so pleasure seeking, but it was self-destructive. If there was anything like that, that characteristic would have been selected out by evolution. Evolution will not allow a characteristic behavior that is self-destructive. Addiction by definition is self-destructive. We could say, gosh, I'm addicted to exercise. Really? You're really addicted to exercise? Well, I don't think so. Okay, 
So you're, you, uh, you may like it and you may actually have compensatory reactions to not exercising when you expect to exercise, but you are not addicted to exercise. Now, you are not addicted to doing your, oh, I don't know, checkbook, okay? You are addicted. You're not addicted to sleep. Okay? You're not addicted to natural food. You are addicted to stimuli that have been artificially intensified. They have been concentrated or intensified. We are causing a more intense reaction in the value system neurons that are involved in that stimulus than, than they are exposed to in nature. And so as a result of that, we wind up disturbing the cost benefit analysis that goes along with me deciding whether I'm going to take another bite of that apple or that bumblebee. What if that wasn't an apple and bumblebee? What if I was snorting heroin? Okay. And the problem is it was causing such an intense reaction. The bumblebee really wasn't that important. Okay. How could we make such a horrendous mistake? Because we have caused a, an extraordinary looking benefit in the cost benefit analysis. It's artificial. It's not true. It's an illusion. It's an illusion of benefit. Okay. That's what Las Vegas is. Las Vegas is one great big multi billion dollar illusion of benefit. They set up gambling systems so that people think that they are going to be successful. And it teases the nervous system that it could be. Okay. Now, I'm not saying don't ever go to Vegas and don't ever gamble a few hundred dollars. If you like doing it, that's fine. But don't think you're going to make money at it. Not in the long run. Okay? That won't happen. And you're not going to be long-term better off from smoking cigarettes, okay? even though you may get some short-term benefit from it somehow. So all addiction is, is the interaction between supernormal stimuli, i.e. stimuli that have been artificially intensified that and a normal and the normal nervous system of the animal so childhood experiences are not associated with this they're not related to it in any way the reason why someone would be quote addicted to rich food is because effectively all human beings on earth should be easily addicted to rich food because the the um doesn't take any specialized weird circuits that are sensitive to cocaine or alcohol to get this done. In other words, that, that stimuli is so closely associated with natural food that every nervous system can make that leap and to, 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 to find the specific chemical that is in there, i.e. sugar, fat, and salt, um, that they can, they can find the calorie density in there that is the signaling device that tells us that that food is more valuable than natural food. Okay it would be evolutionarily suicide to not be able to recognize that. So all human beings can recognize that. So now the question is what, you know, once we know that's true and we know that it's artificially intensified stimuli and we know that it's self-destructive, why can't we stop doing it? And the answer is, well, you were never designed to stop doing it. So it, it's going to take a bizarre set of motivation and action in order to get yourself out of that. Unless you happen to be a genetic freak, okay? And there are, there's a few percentage of, of people in this arena who are very uh, very health pers pursuant individuals. There's a small percentage of them that got there very, very easily, okay? They just happen to be unusual people. Most people that, that do an excellent job of this, um, are, this is a battle, uh, and that that's it's because it is um, natural for us to like a more concentrated food to a less concentrated food. That is a that is an evolutionary imperative that this that the uh, that the value signaling systems that we call the pleasure pathway that the dopamine and endorphin systems would make sure to tell you when you got the richer food, that you are doing the right thing, okay? So that is why that happens, not because there's something wrong with your nervous system because of some experiences that you've had that have damaged you. That is a horrendous misunderstanding of addiction 
So childhood experiences, traumatic events, et cetera, they are not responsible for alcohol problems, cigarette problems, heroin problems, cocaine problems, or overly rich food problems. Those problems are all very simply and understandably a derivative of nervous systems that are designed by nature to be uh, sensitive to certain kinds of chemical stimulation. And that if we get that chemical stimulation intensified, they're very likely to be addicted. People, people's personalities differ tremendously about whether they'll be addicted to gambling. Okay, and so uh, we've actually can identify that. People that almost win and it catalogs in their nervous system that they did win. It was just a freak sort of a little technicality that I didn't win. Those people are highly uh, addicted, uh, addictive sensitive. If you are a person that if you almost win and you don't win, you feel deeply disappointed and like, yeah, it's disgusting. You know, you can never win. If you have a pessimistic type of reaction, you will not be addicted to gambling. In order to be addicted to gambling, you have to have the genes that say, almost got it, I'm going to get it next time. Now that that is genetic. It's not learned. Nice. All yeah. right. Dr. Lyle, there's a, a lot of vegan restaurants up here that make SOS free delicious food. And one of them has a special chef AJ soup that I love. It's like a pho, but instead of putting noodles in, I ask to have it with rice. And every time I eat of it, I eat it. I think of you because you always say we're genetically hardwired to prefer the most concentrated source of calories, but this is a very low calorically dense food. And I'm like, why do I love this so much? It's like literally my favorite food and it's low calorie density. Is there yeah. something? wrong with me that I really, really like something that just happens to be low calorie density? Not that low calorie density. What's in it? Well, even when I don't put the rice in, it's a delicious broth. And then he puts in broccoli, carrot, scallion, bok choy, zucchini. It's just the broth is so good. I, yeah, the I just... broth is mimicking sodium. Mm. Even if it's not high sodium, the point is, is that he's got a spice combination there that's mimicking sodium. Okay. It's, it's the broth is just incredible. I love that's, it. That's what's going on. Because okay. I keep thinking there's something wrong with me. I love this. And there's, it's, there's little calories. Okay. So that's it's what the it broth. is. It's yeah. the broth. Yeah, it's, you're, you're not, you're not just designed for calories. You're also designed for minerals. Mm. So you, that's why when you taste, you know, some green beans, uh, and if you haven't had something like that, you like the taste of these vegetable foods. And it's because there's chemicals in there that are very useful and necessary for human survival. So you're not, if you were just a calorie density eater, we would all be eating big chunks of no salt butter. Okay. We would literally couldn't keep ourselves out of big chunks of no salt butter. The fact that we do not eat no salt butter by the chunk tells you that there's more to the story than calorie density. Calorie density just happens to be an extremely important part of the stimulus that's involved in, in pleasure signaling, but it's not the only one. And so, yeah, you found your fancy soup and that soup, you know, th th there are, there are things that I've eaten that are, are, are not there where they did not add sodium, but they had a spice combination that absolutely mimicked it. And, you know, it's completely exciting. Yeah, that, that's just so interesting to me. Thank yes. you. You know, I, I missed this comment when you were answering the question about the YAL circuits, but I think it's an interesting one from Sarah. She says, do we also have YUWEM circuits? You're underweight, eat more. Yes, absolutely. Without a doubt. If you get too far underweight, then it can activate an anorexia circuit, which is different still. Okay. But yes, if you are underweight, you will you will have a chronic alarm bell going off trying to push you to eat food, without a doubt. Very good, good good comment. And I caught that, thank you. This question is from Shannon. Dr. Lyle, I don't eat before I go to work because I have to be at work at 7.15 a.m. and that's too early for me to eat. So I fast until my lunch break. I am a teacher and can only eat during the set lunch break, which is given to me, which is currently 11.15 a.m. My question is, why don't you like intermittent fasting? I feel much better when I am fasting like this. That's not, that, 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 uh, 
it's not that I don't like intermittent fasting. There's all kinds of things about it that are cockamamie in terms of their logic. Okay, so there's, um, I, I'm going to guess that person is eating up until eight o'clock the night before. So, so what's happening is a characteristic pattern for humans is that they eat most of their calories in the late afternoon and early evening. This is a worldwide phenomenon, and it is also true in the Stone Age. So when you look at Stone Age peoples, the, and the reason for that characteristic, you don't have to do it that way, but the way it's been done for the last million years in human nature has been that the rich food is going to be the, the, the starches that need to be cooked and also the meat that the, that the men hunt. And so the meat and the potatoes that come from all the day's efforts of getting the rich calories, those are going to need a fire. And we're not going to be burning fires all day long. We're going to be burning them once. We're going to light a fire in the late, you know, in the in the late afternoon, evening, and then we're going to cook our food. And so that's going to be where the vast majority of the calories are going to be eaten. The um uh and during the rest of the day, human beings are going to nibble. When, where there is food available, okay, where it's convenient and easy to get it while we're going about our process. So therefore, it's not surprising at all that a person could eat a lot of calories, you know, between 4 and 8 p.m. and then wake up the next morning and they're not hungry. And the reason is, is that they've got glycogen, they've stored a bunch of uh, carbohydrate in their liver, and they are fine. They're not particularly hungry. And so as a result, they may not be hungry till noon, until half the day is gone. That I'm not, that we're not asking that person to deliberately quote intermittent fast. They're doing it naturally. Okay. That's, uh, and now they, they might eat all of their calories between 1130 and 830 at night. And we're like, she, look at me. I ate, ate in a, ate in a nine hour window. It's like, well, that's fine. Okay. But when people start trying to say, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to eat less. I'm going to cram it to a six hour window. Ludicrous. Why would we do this? Okay. And when we start doing that, when we, we, we can start, you know, a lot of people will do this behind a desire to lose weight and then they'll wind up with a very restrictive intensive diet. And then we wind up with a binge restrict cycle and then we get a binge eating and we get a fiasco. So there, there we don't want to do that. But if a person naturally is having a eating within a nine hour window or an eight hour window, like why the hell would I ever measure it? The uh, animals by nature do not do this. Once again, we go, you know, to answer a question intelligently, we back up the camera and we say, okay, let's look at the other two million species on earth and see how they do it. And not a single one of them deliberately foregoes eating when it's available and they're hungry. Never happens. Okay? So why would we expect that it would be advantageous to do it? For what reason would it be advantageous? Oh, because it would help people survive longer because of autophagy. Really? If that were true, then every animal on earth would do it. In fact, it does do it. That's why they aren't eating 24 hours a day. They have natural biological rhythms that drive their motivational systems to perfection when it comes to these choices. And so do you. Okay. So that's why it is not necessary to consciously and deliberately put some artificial template over your actions in this regard. The only thing we need to do is we need to have what do we want Want to make sure we're not doing? We're wanting to eat food that are consistent with your natural history so you're not getting a drug-like effect on the system, therefore systematically overeating as a derivative of that, and then winding up overweight and then searching for solutions for the weight loss problem, which when mysteriously will now include in, from some quarters the notion of intermittent fasting. Like, ludicrous. There's no logic to it. So you're... Uh, neither is there a logic to say, well, you should eat a big fat breakfast in the morning, you know, to start your day right. That's bogus too. That was invented by the cereal industry. Okay. You know, Dr. Wayne Dyer said, 
first be a good animal. Okay. And that means eat when you're hungry, don't eat when you're not hungry, and obviously eat mostly good natural food and you'll be fine. Yeah, well, it, it drives me crazy in the plant-based space how, uh, you know, because it's what you eat and that that is much more important than when you eat, you know? Yeah, when you and, eat, it's not relevant. Yeah, and and so, you know, there's all, it just, I don't want to say the name of the person because I'm sure. not here to bash any other plant-based person, but this whole thing about how it's bad to skip breakfast and, you know, they all these studies and, and L- things ludicrous. like that. You know, because um, it was so interesting what you said that in the Stone Age, they ate most of their calories later in the day because, you know, we have a friend, his 100th birthday is coming up and we love Dr. John Scharfenberg. He doesn't eat dinner, but that's hard for a lot of people because that's the social meal, that's family meal. And it's to me like, I, I don't really care how long I live. I just want my quality of life to be good. And just going to bed without supper just seems like a punishment. Yeah, I mean, the you're also classically conditioned to that. So you, we could classically condition you to eat most of your calories between 10 and three if we did that consistently. In other words, the nervous system actually conditions itself to time and place with respect to food, okay? So if that doctor now doesn't eat dinner, that's, he has classically conditioned that. And once that happens, it's not a problem. So you can, you can do that. You can set a classically conditioned paradigm in place in two or three weeks. And, and then you can have that be the way it is that you live. Um, but you don't have to. In other words, your, your system is, your system will classically condition to whatever it is, the pattern is that is most convenient for you that makes the most sense. Uh, one pattern isn't better than another. There, there, I've had people that eat one large meal at lunchtime. Okay. But they'll just sit down and for about an hour and a half. They just they just sit down and they eat a hell of a lot of food, and they eat very little food before, very little food after. Fine, it's doable. It's a little weird, but um, seems a little inconvenient to me. I don't know that I would push two thousand calories in myself over an hour and a half. But that's but it can be done. So the system is inherently pretty flexible in this regard. Uh, but to, to think that there's an advantage to some uh restriction of that time window is just doesn't make any sense well thank you uh christy says dr lyle do you agree with the recent microbiome buzz about eating a wide variety of foods 30 plus per week with different no. fruits and vegetables no i do not no your your ancestors never ate a diversity that wide. so uh in a given habitat there was a uh a, a, a narrow number of foodstuffs and our ancestors ate ate those they ate what was available and it didn't even remotely look like a modern grocery store did not look like the produce section in a modern, a modern grocery store at all it looked like one tenth of that so uh no i think that that is a whoever is saying that and touting that is basing that on a bunch of you know, c- completely flimsy and and uh, suggestive and unsupported science. There's a lot of the gastroenterologists, even the plant-based ones that are saying that we need diversity. Oh, it's a, it's a, it sounds like an interesting and exciting and knowledgeable and knowing thing to say, and it's completely bogus. And I can tell you that I know it's bogus because whatever that GI problem is, I can fix it by th- eating nothing. Yeah. Nothing. It's the way to fix the GI problem, not by crowding the system with 30 different kinds of wacko things. Instead, all I have to do is have you eat nothing, and then we'll come back with some steamed cabbage, and then after that, we'll add some rice. Guess what? GI problem gone. How did that mysteriously happen? What happened was we got rid of problematic imbalances in the microbiome that were derivative of the diet that you're eating before the fast, once we ate, we got the fast, we got the system able to eventually get back to a much more healthy equilibrium. And we started feeding you food that's appropriate for the species. And now it turns out there's no problem in the GI system. So yeah, instead of eating 30 different things off a checklist to try to fix a microbiome imbalance, you know, either check into True North or talk to Nathan Gersfeld if you don't want to leave home. Talk to Nathan Gersfeld at fastingescape.com. And, 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 and he can 
uh, guide you through a home-based water fast, which will then put you in a position to then refeed and be happy about really healthy food. And then you can get rid of the 30 checklist and just have a, a reasonable, pleasant, easy to manage whole natural foods diet that takes care of the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carrie says, how do I get through being so overwhelmed with my daily tasks? Everything I do seems hard and makes me anxious. Adding anything new to my plate makes me feel so overwhelmed that I just want to sleep. This person saying they have both anxiety and depression. Well, that's a, that's a little bit too complicated of a question to sort of answer easily in a form like this. This is a, um, uh, when, when we are depressed, it's because there is some domain of life that we believe we should be doing better at, but our attempts to do better have failed. So we are frustrated and we are defeated. And uh, this, the nervous system is uh, naturally signaling to us to not continue to put energy into those those. Um, schemes. In other words, we, we, we've had plans to achieve more in a given domain, whether it's romantic friendship or, or professional. Um, and so as a result of that, when we have gotten failure feedback, we are, we're designed by nature to have a feeling called depression, uh, which will discourage us from continuing to do the same failed strategies again. And so the, uh, so we're designed also, uh, to wind up seeking counsel, uh, and people do, they wind up seeking counsel. Uh, the counsel may be helpful or may not be helpful. Uh, but, but one way or the other is that, uh, anxiety is a very close cousin. It coexists with depression. Uh, it's a feeling that I'm going to put some energy because I'm going to continue to try to have success in this domain but I have a feeling that I'm not going to be successful. So I'm kind of depressed and I'm kind of anxious that I'm going to fail. And so depression is effectively the result of having failed. Anxiety is essentially a signal that tells us we're, we're very likely to fail in the future as we're, we go about trying to, to secure the success. So the um, uh, this can, you know, people can feel quote overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by what? Overwhelmed by by what it you know what it is going to take in order for me to apparently achieve what it is that I think that I should have already achieved, and I feel like there's too many too many variables in there, and I'm not confident that I can do it, and therefore I feel overwhelmed. The um so yeah the what do we do? The answer is we need to do an analysis of what is the specific goal that the person is that what's the most important goal of their life where they believe they should be achieving more, but they are not. And that they have tried repeatedly to do the reasonable things to secure that success and they have failed. So what is sort of the epicenter of their negative mood states? The uh, Sometimes there's more than one thing. Sometimes there's three or four. But oftentimes there's one that's main, the main one. And so what we do in attempting to help people is that we discover what that main thing is. And then we figure out what they've already done to try to achieve in that area. We figure out what they, you know, what their feedback has been. And we try to analyze what it is that where they have failed to analyze the competitive problem accurately. Okay. These problems are inherently competitive. So this is this is a departure from my approach, quite frankly, and Dr. Jen Hawk, the two of us. Our approach is different than you will be seen in normal psychotherapy. So normal psychotherapy sees the problems somehow as mysteriously in, internal to you. I see the problems as relationships between you and a competitive environment. Those are two very different ways of looking at psychological struggles. The problems that you have in life have to do with the securing of resources that are under competitive 
stress. Other people want the jobs that you want. Other people have the mates that you want. Other people have the friends that you want. Other people have the houses that you want. Other people have the figure that you want. You are, you are living under competitive stress. So are all animals. Okay. In other words, this just because it's competitive and it's stressful doesn't mean it's terrible or awful. My, you know, my cats live under competitive stress with each other, but they're very happy. Now they box each other every now and then. When I start to feed them, the, 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 the paws start flying. Nobody ever hit, hits anybody. They just threaten. <laughs> but the point is, is that competitive stress is, doesn't, isn't a terrible thing. It can be an exhilarating thing and it can be also just a normal thing. The, um, a, uh, uh, but it can feel like an overwhelming thing when we have failed and we can't understand why and we're demoralized. And so that's when it's useful to seek counsel, uh, from me or anybody else that might be, you know, it could be from Joe, the bartender that essentially can give you some, some, uh, insight into the possible reasons why your performances have not gotten the feedback that you think that they should. Okay. So very often, uh, I will have to, you'll have to dig for some data pretty carefully to try to figure that thing out. And very often the reason for the failures, uh, are only partially what the person was thinking. And that very often there's details that they've overlooked that are important that we can control and improve their probability for success in the future, okay? Uh, sometimes it's telling them that, I'm sorry, there's only one in 5 million Marlon Brandos out there and you're not one of them, <laughs> okay? So there, there's no, you know, there's no telling what a third party might be able to help you with to try to essentially um, clarify why it is that we are struggling. I suggested to her to uh, book a private session with you. All good. All yeah. Right. Well, you know, you know us. We have hundreds more questions, so we can keep going. We can stop because we know you're coming back on Tuesday. For sure, we'll take we'll take two more, AJ. Oh, two more. Okay. Ooh, I didn't have the thing open. Shoot. Okay, here it is. Um, okay, here. Um, this is from Lisa. What do you think of nutritional psychiatry? Do you think there are certain foods that can actually help with anxiety and depression and others that make them worse? They say that studies have shown that people with anxiety have higher inflammatory biomarkers like C-reactive protein, et cetera. Does food really make any difference to our mental health and well-being? Um. I think it does, but in an indirect way. So in other words, if, if you are healthier, if you're not constipated, if you aren't um, having heart palpitations, if you um, essentially aren't sweating because you're, you, you are, you know, you're a hundred pounds overweight. In other words, the healthier you are, then that that's going to be a burden off the system. A lot of psychological distress can come from people who are actually worried about their health and they feel out of control. So they feel like they're just hoping somehow that they don't go the way of their dad, but they're finding that they are. And so as a result, they are live like, like basically a deer in the headlights, just hoping that somehow the doctor is going to be able to manage their metformin in a way that helps them survive. That is a anxiety provoking, depressing sort of state to live in. When they find out that they don't have to do that, but that they are actually in control of the outcomes, that can be a hugely uplifting uh, and psychologically transformative, you know, bunch of knowledge. So that happens often. So that is a routine experience in the Google program, True North, Engine 2. Uh, in other words, People go through transformative experiences, uh, sometimes very rapidly, and their mood lifts tremendously uh, because they 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 now see that they are in control of very very important outcomes. Uh, this person is probably asking a question that is slightly different than that: the, the issue of new quote nutritional psychiatry. So the the notion that there's combinations of foodstuffs that somehow are going to be more, 
you know, more facilitative of this or that psychiatric symptom. Um, not in the whole natural food space, there isn't. If you are, if you're chewing tobacco, you know what I'm saying, and you are drinking loads of coffee, then you are doing things that are disruptive to your, you know, if you're, if you're drinking alcohol and drinking a bunch of coffee, you are disrupting sleep wake cycles. You are throwing mood regulating processes into disarray and you are no doubt, you know, contributing to anxiety and depressive processes. No surprise. But if we're going to start talking about the difference between beets and carrots, and one of them has, you know, you know, beta carotene more than the other one, and then that's associated with people having less anxiety, we are talking complete nonsense. Okay, so that is the, uh, so separate, you know, there's no end, you know, there, there's a, there's a, a lady I know, AJ, you know her, who's a good friend of mine, and uh, always wanted her whole life to be in a, in some 19th century uh, or early 20th century little store that's an apothecary and where she could grind little bay leaves and then mix, mix them with ginseng and then send people home with a little thing in their packet that put it in their tea and that's going to solve their physical problem. Okay, that that desire to be the medicine woman or what then turned out to be the medicine man in modern medicine is the notion that I've got something for you that I can solve it and it's got these little components to it. And in some ways, the more complicated and stylized it can be, the better. This is how you get a bestseller out of a complete pseudoscientific nonsense called, you know, eat right for your type diet. Okay, so, so you know, oh, I'm that type. So if I eat that and I eat that, that's going to do better for me. It's like, this is all complete BS. And so the, the notion that we're going to have some psychiatric impact from, I, I'm one of those people that I need to eat a lot of um, beans in order for me to have my anxiety less. You know, you're the kind of person that needs to eat more potatoes and rice, but I'm the bean kind of person. That's what causes my anxiety. This is ridiculous. Your mood regulating systems are not designed to be sensitive to these chemicals in food at all. They are designed for exactly what it looks like they're designed for. They're kind of, uh, they are feedback processes for competitive problems in existence. They're not designed to be sensitive to nutrition and food. Okay, your taste buds are designed to be uh, to be uh, designed to be differences in in uh, designed to be variant in, uh, as a result of uh, taste and food and chemical configuration of food, but not your mood states. Your mood states are for love and victory and defeat and honor and child, child raising and et cetera. That's what your moods are for. And your moods are specifically not designed to be reactive to the differences in the biochemistry of food. So anybody that's touting that is way off wacko. All right. Nothing else. Good enough. You know, you, you, you just, it's so fun listening to you and you crack me up, you know? I, it'd just be so interesting if the, well, I, I just, you just tell it like it is. Oh, this right. is kind of an interesting question from Candace. I've used your principles in getting along without going along with my family members and coworkers who eat differently, and it works very well. My problem is with people who eat like me and are familiar with your work, so I can't use it on them. Yes. <laughs> that, that, that happens to me with the big Louie that you taught me, because if people know it, they know I'm doing it. Can you please give me some advice on what to say to them? This is my problem. I have to eat an A-plus diet a la Dr. Alan Goldhammer because I have a serious autoimmune disease. If I step one bite out of line, I have a flare. And for this reason, it's not hard for me to com be compliant. And truthfully, when I do step out of a, a line, I don't like it because I feel terrible and then I don't enjoy my food, which I've come to love. It is my vegan friends that give me crap for being so perfect or being no fun anymore. They don't understand why I can't have a glass of wine occasionally or a rich dessert on my birthday or vegan junk food at a restaurant. What can I say to them? We haven't had um, this question before. Interesting. 
I have a serious autoimmune disease. If I get one inch out of line, I'm in trouble. I would love to have a more varied diet, but I can't do it. It's I pay a price in pain. Real simple. That's a that's a 10 second answer. And and anybody that's knowledgeable enough about food and in this space should know that they that that's something that you know is very possible and damn well ought to be respected. I would instantaneously respect anybody. Uh, I would in, you know that that's like a friend of mine saying, "Listen, I can't go in there because they serve alcohol and and I need to stay away from alcohol." In in one nanosecond. I'm like, of course we want them. There's no way. Okay. So this is a, uh, um, that, 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 so that, that's how we do that. Oh, I got one little thing. Uh, cause I, I know that we'll probably have quite a few people listen to this because you've got a big, uh, cohort of people. I am looking for, uh, in, I have a wonderful lady in Austin, Texas, downtown Austin, who is a, uh, a uh, uh, professional, hardworking gal, uh, single gal lives by herself, and she works so hard, she needs a cook. And she is, we're looking for somebody that lives in Austin that that would like, if you got somebody, then you send them my way. I, listen, I, I don't know if these people are available, but I know a lot of people, and one of them is a regular on this show. Uh-huh. She works for PBNSG. She's fabulous. Her name is Lauren Burnick. Now, I don't know if she will do that, but she may know somebody. And then the other person is the fabulously talented Hannah Kaminsky, who does the photos for my books. And they're both extraordinary vegan chefs. So I am going to text both of them as soon as we get off and see if they'll do it or if they know somebody. And then, of course, Rick lives in Austin, too. And if anybody else wants to email me, uh, uh, possibility. Uh, my email is drdougweil at yahoo.com. And uh, this is a, a sweet gal, super, super easygoing, likable, but, uh, you know, o- overwhelmed and could, could use could use a bit of help and is happy to pay for it. So anyway, there you go. Nice. Well, I'm going to I'm going to follow up on that. Thank you. This was a lot of fun, Dr. Lyle. And I can't believe you're coming back in I mean, many, three days. Cause- All right. All right. Take care. Thanks, Dr. Lyle. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back a bit earlier tomorrow, 830 a.m. We have Chef Del Schroff. He's going to be making